Hey everyone, welcome to this live roundtable here at the 2022 I Let Summit. Today we're talking all about use of force and training methodologies. My name is Adam Kanakin. I'm the founder and CEO here at I Let Network, and it is absolutely my pleasure to be here with you today to run this live roundtable. If you had the chance to join us yesterday for our conversation about active threats, prevention, and response, that was amazing. You can go back on this channel. You can go back and rewatch that if you would like. It was a great two-hour conversation with some of the top experts in the world, and today is no different. You will see in a second the panel that we have put together for you. They are some of the absolute legends in the industry, and I am so excited uh, to just sit back and let the conversation happen today. But before we can do that, I do want to give a shout out to our partner, Axon, who is a major sponsor and today's sponsor here at the ILET Summit. A huge thank you to their team. And if you don't already know, Axon is gonna be running TaserCon in January. Uh, I've been graciously asked to come and speak. Um, a lot of the ILET instructors that you're gonna see this week are also gonna be there speaking at TaserCon. It's gonna be a great event right after SHOT Show, January 23rd to 26th. Come on down and check that out. Um, and you may even get to meet some of the guys that are on the panel here who are coming out of Vegas themselves. Additionally, I thank you to our friends at ASP. They are the sponsors for today's live panel discussion. Uh, special thanks to Daryl Harmon for putting a training session together today that we put out for everybody. Um, it was phenomenal. And the team at ASP are amazing at what they do and uh, make sure to check them out when you have the chance. So with that all being said, what I'd like to do is bring on the panel and let everybody introduce themselves and uh, let's get this conversation started. So here we go. All right. I just noticed that I had the music going too, so that was really good. I was I had a, I had a baseline for what I was saying there, um, gentlemen. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this uh, on this panel today. It's an honor to have you guys here. What I would like to do is I'd like to go around the horn, let everybody just introduce themselves briefly. Um, I'll throw your names up here so everybody can see who you are, and um, then we'll just get the conversation going. So Ray, why don't we start with you, brother? Uh, yeah, my name is Ray Bashirs. I'm the founder of Blue Shield Tactical Systems. Uh, we're a training company that uh, trains in uh, defensive tactics, including de-escalation training, instructor courses, active shooter training. Uh, we've been in business since 2013, and we teach across the United States. Excited to have you here, brother. Thank you so much for joining us. John, why don't you go ahead? Okay. My name is John Gentile. I was a Las Vegas Metro police officer for... 20, over 26 years, I was a sergeant, worked a variety of units, covert and overt, and was a defensive tactics instructor for 23 years. Uh, on the side, I love martial arts, so I've always been a student. I still continue to train. I'm a fifth degree black belt in Kun Tao. I've got some Jeet Kune Do instructorship. I'm an apprentice instructor in the Guru Rudan, which everybody, everybody should know him. And I, to be fair, I am affiliated with Tuhan Jared, who's on the, on the, uh, I'm with us today. So I like to try. That's awesome. I appreciate you being here. Tony. Yes, sir. Um, hey, everybody. Tony Blower here. My company, uh, we teach police officers and other uh, public uh, safety professionals pretty much how to manage violence uh, in high stress confrontations. Um, you know, we've done a ton of research on the connection between physiology, kinesiology, psychology teaching people how to weaponize the uh, flinch and how to turn fear into fuel. We use real world scenarios to assess movement. Of course, uh, everything, uh, you know, must be, uh, uh, you know, legal, moral and ethical in the big picture. So our goal is to make everyone safer from their call to uh, inevitably a courtroom. So well, I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Adam. You got a great camera set up today. Good work. I do. I do. It's different than our, our last one. This is this is where I I actually teach four times a week out of the uh, out of the garage, and um, I got those two guys behind me. Uh, uh, you know, they're they're my bodyguards. Love it. All right, Jason, go ahead, brother. Yeah, I'm uh, Jason Harney, uh, retired police sergeant with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, spent uh, about 24 years. And for over 20 years, I taught defensive tactics uh, from the academy level all the way through the instructor trainer level and did that for over 20 years. Uh, today, uh, after having been retired for about seven years, I'm a documentary filmmaker and many of my films, including the one we're going to discuss today, uh, is about the topics that are critical to law enforcement. 
Awesome, brother. Well, I'm excited to have you here and we're excited to showcase um, this amazing production that you put together, including everybody here on this panel. And uh, last but not least, Jared, go ahead, man. Hi, uh, yeah, my name's Jared Weehongi. Um, uh, it's a privilege to be here with you all. Um, I have 22 years of experience in law enforcement, about half of that full-time and about half of that reserve. I left full-time police work uh, a number of years back to uh, run a training business. I teach um, I developed what, what I call the TRICOM training program, and it's essentially uh, was developed primarily for law enforcement, um, soon thereafter for uh, military special operations units. And then now I teach civilians and, and, uh, and uh, executive protection professionals, everything from the empty hand to uh, close quarter firearms and kind of everything in between. So that's kind of what I do now. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's a great opportunity. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, I appreciate you being here, brothers. The first time you and I have had the chance to really jump on and uh, and interact. It won't be the last, I'm sure. Um, just a few housekeeping points for everybody here who's on this, uh, watching this wherever you are. If you're on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, it doesn't matter. There is a live chat. If you have questions for this panel, they are available here to you right now. Take advantage of it. Ask them questions. We're going to answer them for you. That's what we're here for. We're here to answer questions for you. Um, and of course, there's going to be some interesting conversation had along the way. Um, you know, we yesterday when we did our live roundtable, we actually had people from all six inhabited continents attend the live session um, as it was going on. So that's really cool. I can already see there was somebody from South Africa on this one that they chimed in. So that's amazing. Um, and uh, just so everyone's tracking on this, um, I'm up here in Canada. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Tony's previously from Canada, now lives in the United States. These guys are all in the U.S. And uh, Jared, where are you from originally, brother? New Zealand originally. I've been in the States for, uh, well, in and around the States. Uh, the States has been home base, I, could, I should say, for 30 years now. But I was uh, uh, raised in New Zealand. Awesome. That's awesome. And um, it, you may or may not know this. Um, I actually, because I'm Canadian, uh, Chris Mandigma, who I absolutely love to death, um is uh is one of your guys and yep. uh is the tricom uh, tricom arm up here in canada correct um, and uh he's an absolutely phenomenal instructor and if you weren't available he was gonna i was gonna drag him on here as well so he's a great guy um, but i appreciate you uh being here um all right guys so what i would like to do is i would like to pass this over to jason because he's kind of the reason we're all here together he brought all of you together um to create this amazing documentary uh that we uh that we have here that we're gonna be talking about today called wrist lock and the martial arts influence on police use of force. And so, uh, Jason, what I'd like to do, brother, is just give you the floor and kind of maybe just give us uh, the background, why this thing exists and, and why you put it together. Wow, well, there's really a, a lot of different reasons. I mean, I could go back, you know, early into my career when I first met uh, John Gentile and, and you know, we, we were working graveyard shift together at the old Southwest Area Command and, and talking about these very issues which were already important to us as rookie police officers. But now you fast forward to now and talk about things in more of a general sense. I'll say that we brought this incredible group of 17 martial artists and police experts together uh, to address very common issues within police training. And they're issues that unfortunately our police leaders across the country don't like to talk a whole lot about as we know, especially as police trainers. At, at its core, we know that every defensive tactics technique that we teach to law enforcement is derived from martial arts. And we'd certainly love to see our cops start to adopt the habits that good martial artists have, such as discipline, dedication, and mindset toward mastering these skills. But on, a, on more of a training level, if you think about it, there are three main factors that every use of force situation needs to have in order for a police officer to be have a successful outcome in those various situations. And as a trainer, I would say those three are defensive tactics, proficiency, physical fitness, and mental health. In my opinion, if any one of those is compromised in any way, meaning you have a lack of defensive tactics proficiency, you're just simply not good enough at the tactics that you're deploying on the street in that scenario. Or if you're so out of shape that you're unable to uh, utilize these tactics in a method that is going to lead to success in that scenario because your heart rate is racing, or you just can't move the way you used to. We, we like to use age as an example or as an excuse a lot of times. And then, of course, mental health. I think you can make the argument that certainly if 
uh, an officer's mental health is compromised, they could either overreact in a situation or underreact in a situation. So in a nutshell, that's why we made risk lock to bring these issues to a mainstream conversation and allow people to finally start talking about them in a manner that will lead to uh, solutions. Well, I had the the pleasure of watching it, uh, jumping on and, and actually getting to sit through the entire thing, which was phenomenal. And uh, there was so much to it. It was kind of just like just when people started to get into things that you obviously had to switch because you had to cover so much. And so part of me was screaming inside, but the uh, ADHD part of me absolutely loved it. So um, that was great. One thing I do want to jump into is we have some exclusive clips from the documentary itself that we're going to be showing today but is there anything top of mind for uh for any of our panelists here that you want to use as a jumping off point to start the conversation is there anything that's happened recently something that you're doing right now that you want to talk about well, i would just say at once i would just say um and, you know to anybody <laughs> listening or watching this when we picked who was going to be in the film which we had many a sit downs we wanted to make sure we captured not just. Uh oh. He's, he's thinking. He's, he's thinking. thinking. He's thinking intently. Well, well, uh, well. His uh, Wi-Fi gets sorted out. Um, what we're gonna do think, here I think is. He was uh, saying, hey, ahead, I, Tony, yeah. You were you important, know, but I think I think he was saying that uh, <clears throat> all of the really good people weren't available and then he picked all of us <laughs> can you hear me i don't know yeah now I'm... you're back yeah you froze for a second there brother well and we sat down and we came up with this we've been talking about this for years the good thing was we've got a good variety of people that contribute to policing and they contribute to that defensive tactics and we we tried to get a good cross section of people that could make this film what it was which was have that diverse background of people that were involved with policing, defensive tactics, coaching, coaching cops, and, you know, conquering the issues that were there. Because we've been talking about them forever. And we're going to talk about them 10 years from now, unfortunately. But, you know, let's let's face it. You know, if the film creates conversation, I think we did good. Yeah. You know, this. Uh, I'm looking at the panel here and there's like, almost 200 years of martial arts experience. And then if Tony leaves, there'll be like almost a hundred years. So that's still pretty good. Um, <laughs> which is great. Hey, um, I do want to, I do want to ask one thing um, because I, I had this video sent to me and um, I wanted to talk about before we jump into the wrist lock stuff, but um, this is going to be specifically for Jared. Um, the video from the strip mall in Australia from about a month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Um, I can pull it up if you want, but that has been at, I have gotten more questions from more defensive tactics instructors about that video than anything I've seen come out in a long time. Um, whether they're like, I could use this for TAC med, I could use this for X, Y, or Z. It's almost universally applicable because of what happens. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that real quickly before we jump into everything else. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I know exactly which video you're talking about. And the, the first thing that comes to mind there is, um, the, the, the reasons why I always say the fight you'll always survive is the one you've been able to avoid altogether. And obviously there were things that could have been done leading up to that, that would have saved this young man's life. You know, there was, uh, and, and I don't have to kind of explain it. It's quite obvious, but as far as the actual video itself, there's a couple of things to be kind of take note of there. One is how um, dangerous a knife can be, even in an untrained person's hands. Um, you know, uh, in, in that type of situation, target specific. Obviously, this uh, there was a, a specific target hit in the crowded area of this individual, and it wasn't an immediate um, incapacitation. It takes some time, um, you know, not a lot of time, but it takes some time. Uh, it's, there's things to be learned about that from from both sides of the spectrum, whether I'm defending myself with an edge weapon or a firearm or defending against it. And then on the defensive side of things, again, um, there's a lot of things that could have been done to avoid a situation like this. It's never going to be good um I'll, i teach um i teach a lot of uh counter edge weapon edge weapon countermeasures courses and i'll tell people it's that there's there are no absolutes you can train uh in an unavoidable situation you know um you can train to increase your odds of survival but it's always going to be ugly and there's no absolutes in combat you can all you can do is train to increase your odds of surviving that type of a situation does is is everybody on the does everybody on the panel know the video that i'm talking about 
Is, is it the one where the uh, kid gets stabbed in the throat and dies like 30 seconds? What the fuck are you? Get the fucking mic. Get the fucking mic. So, um, Jared, maybe you could give some contact. I'll, I'll just mute it um, so we don't need to hear it. Maybe you can give some play-by-play as we watch this. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this, the, the knife was present, whether the guy saw it. Uh, and uh, it's obvious at one point that they know that there's a blade involved. So they obviously kind of discount the fact that this, uh, this guy they're dealing with is armed. Um, looks like they're antagonizing the situation again. They could have just walked away. You know, they're trying to, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's egos flaring and whatnot. Um, so a lot could have been done up to this point to just kind of like walk away and let it go. Um, and, and just a quick um, parental advisory for anybody watching this. This does get fairly graphic. So if you don't want to watch, I would suggest not uh, to avert your eyes now. So as we play this. Yeah. I've, again, I've, this guy that he just, he just got stabbed walks up to the guy. His hand, I mean, if you have to engage a subject and you walk up to someone with a knife and your hands are down, action versus reaction, it's going to be really difficult to protect yourself at that point. You know, this is this is material stuff that you know uh, I know I know from firsthand that Tony teaches really well with regards to um, responding to, to to close quarter um, threats. Uh, but this is you know again, if you have to engage for some reason. Having your hands down in that type of position is not going to be in your favor. You know, you've got to keep the hands up. You've got to be aware of the threat. It's going to come quick if you get in within arm's reach. Uh, but like I said, in this particular situation, there's so much that could have been done to just, you know, let it go and walk away and live the fight another day. Well, and and I think the, the reason I wanted to bring that up, one is I want to jump into the clip that we uh, you recorded for, for wrist lock because that was one of the clips that when I had people ask me about, um, they're like, why is there knife fighting? <laughs> Why is there knife fighting in this? And I'm like, I don't think that's what it's about, brother. We have to contextualize this a little bit as it, to the training component, specifically the drills that you were doing. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is from that video specifically, just the, I think a lot of people were taken back by the speed at which that actually, the, the actual incident occurred. So from the time that the strike happened to the point where that guy had bled out on the floor was maybe 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what's scary about it. That's why when we say like, you know, from a, from a mass hemorrhage, from a bleed perspective, you can't even stop that. I don't care. I don't care what type of uh, 18 Delta medic you have with you. That guy's gone. Yeah. Right. And and, so and, and, exactly. And I'll talk, you see kind of studies on the percentage of blood loss that has to occur before physical incapacitation. A lot of times it's actually just shock. Also, when someone sees that much blood coming out of their neck, um, you know, people, uh, sometimes this is a, a factor of just going into shock involved also, but um, yeah, it, it'll, it'll, you're, you're going to go down quite fast once you've, uh, and there was another video that was just maybe a few weeks uh, or so before that one that happened at a, uh, in, in a bank robbery in Brazil where a guard shot a guy in the neck and the guy's running around. It took a little bit long for that guy to, 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 to before he was, you know, before he was out, but um, same thing, blood kind of going all over the place until he eventually just dropped. So, um, and I don't mean to bring that up just for the sake of the shock and awe of, of that kind of incident. Um, this is a conversation about training methodology in use of force. How can we, and we can go around the table here, um, how can we utilize videos like that and inc unfortunate incidents like that to train our officers better? Oh, what, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of real quickly on, on that, you know, um, one thing I like to, to illustrate for officers if I'm teaching a counter edge weapons course is just how dangerous weapons are in close quarters. Sometimes people like dismiss it. Even people, a lot of times there's people in the public, oh, why did you shoot the guy in the leg, this type of thing. But in close quarters, from statistics that were presented uh, often by um, Caliber Press in the Street Survival Seminar, um, at close quarters, an edge weapon is actually more lethal than a firearm. So first of all, not to discount how, how quickly things can go bad when you're dealing with an edge weapon. I think officers themselves, when they're getting a call on somebody with a knife, need to mentally prepare for that. I think they need to start there. I mean, let's face it, you know, unpredictability can happen, but a lot of officers do get calls, people with a knife. And we know that sometimes that does not turn out the best, whether it be suicide or just someone mentally distraught or someone who just, you know, you, you see them out there. They're, they're just crazy. So, I think officers have to mentally prepare before they even get there. If they have protocols in place and they have plans and they have canine and different, you know, for, for edged weapons, you should be thinking of things. Where are they at? Are they walking into a casino? I mean, are they in the middle of the street? Are they, you know, in a rural area? That, that does change things because as Jared would attest to, you need distance. 
You know, you need distance. You need some thought process on how you're going to address that. Actually, that, that's Tony's favorite subject, the Tuller drill. Let's let him go off on that one for a so, second. But I want to ask you, what, what type of, Adam, what type of questions are you getting? Like, I look at that video, and aside from what, you know, what John just said and Jared just said, which is more, hey, knives, knives are insanely dangerous. And, you know, the expression, don't bring a knife to a gunfight is ridiculous at a certain distance. Someone can close that distance. And this is the whole tooler thing, which is, you know, in many ways, misunderstood, misunderstood. Uh, Jared's heard me do that, that rant years ago in, in Salt Lake and stuff like that is that you, the, the distance that you think you have in every demo is way bigger in real life because in the demo, there's what we call ACP awareness, consent, and preparation. You know, you're doing a demo. You've agreed to be there. You've made sure the weapons are safe and somebody's filming and then you, you do it again and you do it. You don't get that opportunity in the street. I looked at that video and I hate watching it, but it, it affects my physiology, that video. But I'm curious, Adam, what type of questions were cops asking you about that? Because that's not a cop video to study other than other than this is how dangerous a knife is. And and somebody can go, hey man, wow, and they're and they, they do this, and you thought it was a back fist, but they had a straight edge in their hand. And next thing you know, your I had a, a, a student of mine back in the eighties was in in somewhere in uh, South America, uh, got into a confrontation with a guy at a bar, and uh, I'm going to do it to the Bob dummy, you know, here got in confrontation with the guy at the bar. This is this is uh, my student, and the guys like this are having words like this. The guy turns around and then turns back to the guy and then goes, you know, man, he goes, they go fuck yourself. And he shoves the guy like this. Am I like to swear too late? He just shoves the guy down here like this. And then he walks away from the guy. And then my student is standing there, turns to his buddy and he goes, what the hell was that? Next thing he knows, he's, he starts to feel weak. He looks down and he's got blood pouring out of his shirt. The guy had taken a straight edge and stabbed him between two ribs, just missing his heart, almost died. Um, like, like this was an amazing assassination attempt that somebody had practiced and, and analyzed and stuff like that. So it's it's funny. One of my things, and, and everybody, you know, uh, uh, all of you on, on this on this uh, call have seen me do the rants and stuff. Some of you uh, live, Jared, we've trained together. Uh, 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 Jason and John, you know, film me. John tried to kill me in my garage here. Um, uh, but I get so passionate about like, what scenarios are we studying to evaluate the relationship between physiology, kinesiology, and psychology? Yes, there's an education on like, like if you, if you think, cause you've got a gun that, that you're protected from a knife is ridiculous. And that's why you know, having somebody like Jared with his knife background, his weapon background is critical to understand because it demystifies the fallacies and it makes you comfortable. Like I say, like for ground fighting, I think the last place you should be in any fight is on the ground. But you need to study ground fighting because many fights can fall there. But there's also a psychological factor. And that is the person who's not afraid of the ground is the hardest person to take to the ground. If you're afraid of the ground and you go to tackle me and part of my brain emotionally, psychologically, he's like, I don't want to go there. You're going to fall there. Right. So there's a whole bunch of, I sent you, I don't know if you can, if you can uh, pop that up. Cause this is, um, I sent you a video that we used in our training. And some of you might've seen this of a cop getting stabbed in the neck very recently. Now that's a relevant thing. And it says exactly what Jared, what John said is like, you're standing beside a guy, you haven't cleared him. You don't know. Oh, he's emotionally disturbed. Okay, we're talking to him, but the cop has his hands down and gets stabbed in the throat. Um, uh, are you able, are we able to pop that up? Yeah, give me a second. I'll I'll make it work. Okay. Um, if you can't, I, hopefully it's not locked. My I had my office send it to you, but like that is something where you can look at now and go, oh, this is actually a call, and this is actually an example where you know this distance is not controllable. We we always say things like create space, create space. But almost every call is in a confined space. And the only person that is really not at risk in a confined space is a sniper. Everyone else is like always within arm's reach here. I don't know if you can go full screen on that. Have you guys seen this? Yeah. You can put us along the bottom. Yeah. 
Yeah, just play it. We'll, you, you get the idea. Take you out of here. Please. Okay. And I'm in, please. All right, let's go. Come on, please. Let's go. Oh! Oh, there, 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 there. Please. Okay. And I'm That's in, please. It. Super short. All right, let's so, go. What's amazing is, of course, uh, you guys will recognize this, but there's that primal start of flinch, but it's late. People like always tell people, you can flinch late. Your body's survival system, non-consciously, will still come out to protect the head. But if you're in there, uh, presuming compliance, you got your hands down. Shouldn't I mean? Anyways, I'll, I'll let the the police officers here, you know, take take it from there. So like, that scenario, there is a great example of what the guys were, were talking about. Well, that's it's like a great example. <clears throat> that's a great example of what takes place. Yeah. You know, you saw contact and cover. You know, there was an officer behind him. Obviously, we got that's how we got the video. But you know, close proximity. You know, you're in someone's house. Well, we also have to be looking at. And it's like I tell our, our officers when we when I teach our knife defense instructor course, I tell them I said, uh, you know, we got to be looking. What is there? A wa which hand has a has a watch on it, for instance? So now now that tells me that person is probably right handed. If they're holding the cell phone and holding it in the left hand and using the right hand to operate, then it tells me most likely they're right handed. Which that's where that knife is generally going to come from is that dominant hand. And that's what they're going to be accessing. So we got to look for body language, where they're putting their hands. Same thing we've been preaching in law enforcement forever. We continue to preach distance. And we violate that distance or let it be violated on a regular basis. Uh, so we got to get back to the basics of it and also stop teaching, uh, you know, officers to take away knives. Uh, you know, techniques where they, they reach and they take away the knife from the offender during the technique itself. That's overly complicated for for uh, agencies that are getting probably a medium uh, of four hours of training, if that, per year in defensive tactics. Now we're expected to teach them to take knives away from people. It's about survival. There's, and it comes back to that. It's about survival. I think, I think it goes one step more, too, even though this, isn't, this is more procedural. Uh, how about a pat down? You know, because if you're going to be in close talking to somebody for a while, that's more of a procedural type thing. But if you can articulate patting them down, I don't know if the beginning part of this this particular call. They look good, but bottom line is anybody you talk to, if you're going to be in that close, it would be nice if you patted them down to ensure that they didn't have a weapon. Yeah. And, and kind of to add to that, you know, um, you know, in this particular incident, you know, where are the hands? You know, obviously we always teach um, officers that the hands will kill. And if you can't see the hands or even more so the palms of the hands at any given time, then there should be some kind of an assumption that there, those hands are a, a risk and a threat. And so, you know, that's a kind of another thing in that particular. And again, I hate kind of second guessing ever, um, you know, what officers do, but there's definitely learning points to be uh, to be uh, gleaned from some of these videos. and. And uh, that's how fast things can happen. Like, like Tony said, you can't, you know, deal with people from, like a sniper. You know, we got a, uh, a law enforcement officer at some point where they're dealing with people. They, they, they sometimes, you know, you'll think you can always maintain that, you know, that safe reactionary gap. But how do I put handcuffs on someone if I don't get in close? How, how do I get ID from someone, hand them a ticket or so on and so forth? So police officers are constantly getting that close, getting within that danger zone. Yeah, Tony, to answer your question about what, what questions I was getting asked, it was primarily around, hey, can we use this video for training? And if so, how would we build scenarios around this or whatever? Um, and to all of your points, what you had just brought up, um, the only thing that I could think of realistically was uh, teaching human behavior, pattern recognition, situational awareness, what, how to avoid being put in that situation in the first place. Um, because like you had just said, if, if you're already there, it's, it's going to be too late, so. Yeah, it's interesting. One last thing. If, if you're asking the question, how would I use this in a scenario, then you don't understand a lot of things and you shouldn't be teaching self-defense at that level. Sorry, sorry to uh, uh, be so blunt. But if you're asked like that, that scenario was all about ego, pride uh, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other shit. You had I again I, and when I dissected it with with my group, I, I said, if if you could whisper in the guy's ear five seconds earlier, hey, in 35 seconds from now, you're going to be dead because you're here hanging out with the wrong people. If they believe that, that person would have went, you know what, I'm out of here. You know, uh, so uh, so, you know, uh, again, not not to be uh, a blunt. There's a um, um, but if, if you're looking at a scenario going, 
I wonder how I could use this. Then you don't understand scenario training enough and, and the relevancy of, of what you're doing. And it's, and uh, you know, but anyways, don't get me started there. There, the, the, dis, the distance is always controlled in that scenario, in that type of scenario, just like the one, the cop one that I showed you guys, um, or that you, that you showed Adam, uh, the like actions always faster than reaction. And, and the, we call these bad guys, the Jack in the box, right? And you can have the Jack in the box there and you know, the clowns in there and you can be ready with your three stooges finger jab. And you're going dun, 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 the music's coming. You will never finger jab the clown popping out of the Jack in the box before the lid pops up and the clown comes up and, and, and scares you. So you need to be looking at it at that level first. How do you control stuff? Uh, and, and then like John was saying, you know, you've got some procedural stuff. You're in there, like even just saying, Hey man, are you armed? You know, just, and I'm making fun here. Hey, are you going to stab me in the throat in 10 seconds sir? And if like, you're going to see some sort of body language shift, that's going to intuitively tell you I'm going to move now, or I'm going to create space, but people stand around. And, and here's an interesting thing, um, that I think is so important. And that is the last few years, what it's done to people uh, in the law enforcement community. Um, there was a story, I can't mention the department and the person because I don't know what it is, but I just heard this this week, who uh, was uh, 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 shot in the face on a call. His partner shows up and the first thing he says isn't, am I going to die? Get me some medical. Is He says something to the effect of, hey, I don't think I had my body cam on. He was worried about like like am i going to get in trouble cuz i not am i dying i was shot in the face that's insane right so that's another rant and and to bring this back to the whole point of this whole thing is if if you look at at the way uh all of us look at violence and some people like think that i'm not a martial artist because i do all like start up flinch and i'm doing so everything that i see and do is because I'm a martial artist because i've I, my whole life has been about I abhor violence and I want to avoid violence, so I study violence. And so if we come back to the point of the documentary and the message here is what makes us potentially safer and more dangerous to threats in the street is because we take our personal safety and the safety of our family and the people that we teach uh, very seriously. And whether we come at it through uh, a Filipino martial art, uh, a Japanese martial art, uh, an eclectic martial art. It's still about learning how to manage fear and managing violence. Yeah, I don't know who said it, but it's kind of like the whole, uh, the, you know, the best way to never get into a fight or the best way to never lose a fight is to never get into a fight, right? Like that's... I think Jared said that. I think it might have been Jared, yeah. Like yeah. the subway guy, right? <laughs> um, so what I want to do here is uh, let's... Let's play the let's play one of these clips from uh, from wrist lock. I'm excited to do this. Um, and uh, Jared, if you're cool, why don't we play? Uh, why don't we play the clip of uh, of yours from the uh, the video? You good with that? Sure thing. This is what we call a bisecting line principle. Okay, I'm trying to get a big line, i.e., your forearm, to intersect with my forearm, and that way I'm creating margin for error. Okay, if my timing is not perfect, I can still make it work. If I do it correct, I'm getting a good angle, a okay, position of strength outside of 90 degrees using that bladed part of my forearm, jamming down, and it's a good, strong position, but I combine that with my footwork and my body angle, okay? And then from there, I immediately train to check your elbow. This is important, okay? Because unless I check your elbow, I cannot control the movement, the rotation of your upper body. One, two, okay? Now, how can we do this in a way that we're both getting the benefit of training that movement over and over again. We're gonna do it in a flow, okay? So forget about what's in my hand. This is not a knife versus knife drill. It's both of us training counter knife, right? We're gonna feed each other the attack. So you, do, you attack to me, I'm using my arm. One, two, I move, and then I'm gonna feed that to you. One, two, okay? And then you're gonna feed it to me again. One, two, and I'm gonna feed it to you. One, two. So in a very fluid manner, we're gonna practice footwork, hand coordination, body angle, okay? And we're just gonna do that over and over, defending that initial attack, right? So that's the first evolution here. And in a short period of time, I find that officers, they do this for five minutes and they're just moving now. Awesome. 
uh, lend some context to that. Yeah. So, um, and you, you're you're cutting out a little bit there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So that video, and I kind of like the, the fact that you use that particular one because there's actually a principle in that video that I learned from Tony uh, 18 or more years ago about um, you know the the strength of the arm at certain angles. You know, um, and he articulates that very well. The, the, the biomechanics involved with that, but um, that yeah. So that the context of that particular drill is you know um, just learning a, kind of isolating it's an isolation drill um i'm isolating the kind of a stimulus response my an immediate reaction a lot of times when i'm teaching this stuff and i was just teaching it last week to a, some a law enforcement instructors in uh, in, uh, in teton county in wyoming um that there's kind of getting people a simple way to get people to coordinate their hands and their feet and the body things that they may have never done um and um and again it's at the same time they're learning this coordination they're actually Kind of doing some stimulus response identifying a particular angle of attack one of the most common angles you'll see with with the blades and then um and then defending against it spontaneously just kind of um get, getting into a, a, a rhythm and a movement and in a way that this is the this is the thing i and I, like i mentioned in that particular drill i have to always explain because both participants have a knife it kind of at, at first glance it looks like it's a knife a knife on knife drill which it could be but really the contents of the hands in that particular drill are irrelevant. I could have a flashlight in my hand. I could have my firearm because um, I'm actually using the forearm for most of it. And so it's just basically defending using kind of what I call high probability techniques, larger bisecting lines, um, larger parts of the body that are strong to defend. Um, and then uh, the next step, which would be to control the limb if I have to engage. You know, as we follow on to that, I'll, the first thing I'll always teach people is um, how to survive that attack and then disengage create space and uh and uh, fight to your weapon you know get, you know distance is your friend against an edge weapon get your firearm out and continue and then we get into the situation where okay i don't i'm in, I'm in that enclosed space now there's close quarters i can't disengage so what's next how do i stay engaged and fight my way still fight my way to my weapon safely or what are my empty hand um uh, uh, possibilities in the same uh, scenario awesome I think the other problem that's created a lot of times when officers are being attacked with a you know by a knife in those close quarters uh, combat situations is they start trying to access tools that are no longer available to them in that close proximity, like their firearm, uh, taser, or whatever it may be. We've even seen that scenarios where they're accessing taser during a knife attack, which is is beyond me. But uh, uh, which then you know allows the person to continue to stab because the knife doesn't jam. Uh, but if we if we close the distance at that point, though, and jam the arm, now we're essentially jamming the top of a, of a firearm of a semi-automatic. Now we're able to move at angles and hopefully separate ourselves to now where we can access those tools again on our belt, which is imperative. And, and that's very, very, uh, you know, that's that's it's, it's simple but profound, you know, truths when it comes to this type of stuff. And I, I oftentimes will use um, kind of an expression when teaching, which is, you know, self-preservation before weapon presentation. So don't think, don't just think I'm going to pull my gun and shoot the guy. If you just got stabbed in a lethal area, you know, i.e. the videos we just watched, you're not going to survive long enough to get that gun out. So survive the ambush first, self-preservation, and then look to fight your way to your weapon if that's indeed an option. And I would suggest if you're going to make it realistic for your officers, the ones that are listening over there uh, in the comment section, uh, you know, introduce shock knives or something like that. Uh, the company out of Canada, but uh, introduce, uh, you know, shock knives into it. And then it'll make it realistic for the for your participants. And they'll realize that grabbing a blade and things like that are not it's not a good plan. Yeah, well, we have set can up here in Winnipeg. So obviously, uh, Jeff is uh, I've had the opportunity to speak with Jeff multiple times and, and play with shock knives multiple times. Um, and uh, yeah. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. We, but, we were just, yeah, just last week when I was teaching this course, we were incorporating shock knives into this, the high stress drills. They just kind of add another level to the drills that uh, it's hard to replicate without that type of technology. I love it. I love it. Um, all right. Does anybody have any other thoughts on, um, on that video clip that we just watched? Any takeaways or things like that? Um, I guess that the question that comes up sometimes with with knives uh with knife <clears throat> knife drills knife fighting counter knife anything with knives or bladed weapons when it comes to law enforcement is why do we need to train with this i have a gun right uh that that happens that question gets brought up so what is it um what is it specifically about the drills that you were showing there jared um that are applicable regardless like you had said you could be using a knife you could be using 
a, a, a closed baton. It could be a flashlight. It could be your firearm. The drills that you were doing are not just applicable to knives. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people mistake when they see stuff like that is they say, well, what, you, why would we train with knives? Administrators see training like that, and they see Jared with a knife in his hand training. They said, we don't want our officers touching knives. We don't want Jared coming anywhere fucking close to us, right? I'm sure you've experienced that before. How do we get past that barrier with these administrations and these um, kind of this old way of thinking? Well, I mean, yeah, part of it is just in you know, the education process, because like I, like I was explaining that particular drill, the reason why I like to have both participants <clears throat> holding knives is because you just in it's training time. We all know that law enforcement have law enforcement officers have very limited training time. So in this type of flow drill, both people, both students are getting the benefit of a response to an attack back and forth. And, and so I find that the kind of the return on investment, time investment in that type of that type of drill is very high because in a short period of time, I'm getting people to kind of just coordinate. It's, it's, it's relatively simple, but if you've never done it, it can feel complex. And so, um, you know, just kind of educating people that, you know, like you said, maybe I'm, I'm drawing my gun and that stab's coming. Well, I got a choice. I can trade a shot for a stab or I can use the same technique with the weapon in my hand or whatever's in my hand at that moment. I don't have to discard it. Um, and then continue. So that's kind of the idea is just continuing through with tactics that, that aren't dependent on on what is or is not in your in your hands. Um, and and, you know, as far as the other side of it, too, as far as law enforcement is concerned, with regards to knives, um, you know, when I say the other side of it, when an officer is actually using a knife, that's a common course that I'll, I'll teach duty knife as a backup weapon. And um, it's um, it, it, again, some I've taught it at state levels in some states and I've had <laughs> other places that they just won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. So it's just a matter of, you know, it's really kind of hit and miss more so uh, miss with regards to knife, uh, uh, you know, adaptation of knife programs in law enforcement. But uh, just you know, something that you got. It is an education process. People realizing, hey, we give all these tools to our officers, um, which, are, you know, or we allow them to carry them, i.e. knives. Um, all the other tools have training programs and policies and whatnot. This one does not. So, you know, um, so it's, you know, you can go on and on about why I feel those types of forces are important. And I even have several documented cases where officers have used knives to, to save their lives. Um, but it's like I said, it's just an education process and getting um, the right time. Timing is also a big, a big thing when you've got the right administrator, ed administrator sometimes that uh, mm -hmm. is making those decisions. But um, it, it is an education process. And if I can add, I know some some other people want to speak up, but we tried to bring in the duty knife as a backup weapon three times, and we did. Jared worked with me on bringing that in, but I have to tell you that politically, the departments, when it comes to like a knife or you hear about a knife, um, they they just they kind of frown upon it. It's just not the best in PR today, you know. So they haven't viewed it as just another. You know, every officer carries a knife. There's no question. Every officer carries a utility knife somewhere. Somebody carries an extra gun somewhere. So, you know, why can't you have a knife? I can tell you that the publicity around it, just the word itself kind of just scares people and, you know, scares administrators who are not as educated to see that value that, okay, our officers are going to kill, you know, they're going to have a utility knife on them, which that's generally how we present it is it's another emergency tool, right? It's a utility knife. It's not only for cutting seat belts, but it's something you have on your belt. Everything you carry on your duty belt, you would think you should have some instruction on how to use it, right? I mean, flashlight, flashlight's pretty much, it's in policy. I do not recommend, of course, having a knife policy, but because we already are bound by too many policies. But, you know, if you look at the expandable baton, depending on your program, you're going to see that even if you have a flashlight in your hand, you can use that. If that's at nighttime, if you have a flashlight in your hand, it's understandable that if it's not practical, maybe for you to have something else, you can use it like what? An expandable baton. Unfortunately, with knife, it's just as far as publicity and PR, uh, departments tend to shy away from it. So it yeah, falls into it, it falls into it doesn't look good policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but every officer carries one. We, I think we all can attest that we we've all carried one, <laughs> and I, you know, at any one time. I think I think up here in Canada too, and and obviously, Jared, you probably had conversations with Chris about this. It, you know, I can you can carry a pocket knife all day long. 
it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. But the second you put a tactical knife or a dagger on your vest, it's game over. <laughs> like people do not like, but you had just said there, it's optics, right? That yeah. looks aggressive. What is that thing? And why is it hanging out of your vest? That is designed to do one thing and one thing only. And you're supposed to be here protecting the peace, not going out there and stabbing people. So the, it's the, those aggressive looking uh, tools um, that usually is what gets picked out first and foremost when, I mean, you guys are all aware of this too. And everybody listening to this, you know, it's just another mechanism. It's just another way to use it. A pocket knife, once it's extended, functions the exact same way. Well, think about a baton, right? Someone uses a baton in a, in a situation, someone takes a picture, you know? How bad does that baton look? Now, you know, the taser came along. If you look at, like, low lethal areas of use of force, you'll find out the taser has far outdone all of that. Why? Biggest reason really is lack of training on the baton because they don't practice enough and two uh it just it just looks better you know they they have a belief that it looks better and it's, it's a lot of people think it's more effective and you know you can d debate that of course but you know bottom line is that's fallen into that pr category as well as the profession even though we still have them which is it's good to still have them you know I think the way the reason why one of the big reasons you guys why we wanted to make a film like this is to speak about these topics to the mainstream audience who has no idea if we're being honest of the complexities of a police officer's job and the abilities that a cop must have each time they arrive on a call or have a contact with a person for whatever reason they're there for it doesn't matter. So when you talk about things like being taken to the ground or you talk about facing uh, the wrong end of an edged weapon, a police officer has to have those abilities and those abilities only come from training. And when I found just through my own uh, personal success on my agency, and John can certainly attest to this, you have to have leaders that are progressive and it starts at every level, but it's most important at the highest level. And to give you a great example to, uh, you know, bring Tony into this. Uh, I first met Tony in person in 2006 when he came and visited our police academy and I was the sergeant of our academy at the time. I was fortunate enough to have progressive leaders that when, uh, you know, we saw Tony's presentation on his high gear suit and I'm like, that is the key. That is what we need to take the next step in order to have the proper reality-based training for these police recruits to have them establish the proper foundation moving forward in their training as it relates to police use of force. Uh, the leaders I had said, when I said I wanted to buy 10 of them, so each instructor had their proper size, it happened the next day. And as I've told Tony many times, it literally transformed our ability at the time to provide the training that these new officers needed in, in, in such a, uh, a crucial way. I mean, I can't even begin to attest how important that was at the time and where we are now. But I think the problem with a lot of police agencies is there's 18,000 of them and, and some large percentage, particularly the smaller ones, are stuck in the dark ages and they have leaders that are going to more be apt to tell you this is how we've always done it. And so they're not going to listen to a Tony or a Jared or a Ray or a John when they tell them, you guys, these are the threats our cops are facing. And I'm here to tell you they're not prepared for the fight. Well, also, I'd like to add to that when we're talking about the knives, I do believe that there should be some type of policies uh, uh, that carry uh, that address carrying knives and what type of knives to carry. In my state, for instance, in Texas, you can carry a sword legally uh, on your back. Uh, so uh, it, it just really just really depends. So and when we talk about uh, a knife being a tool, but to a jury, when we're trying to sell a karambit as a tool, it looks like a menacing tool. It doesn't look like it's made to cut seatbelts. It doesn't look like it's made for that purpose. And then we know, we realize every officer out there is carrying knives, but then we don't train them with that knife. So they don't build the, build the blueprint to respond if they're being tacked by accessing a knife. If they're not accessing that knife during training, then that's not going to be there. Just like it's not going to be there on the range if we're not doing reloads and we're not doing the things we should be doing on the range as well. So we need to incorporate that training and, and incorporate those knives and, and to be able to respond uh, in that close contact situation with that knife. 
That's yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I, I, I second that. You know, I, I think, you know, uh, with, in the, with the lack of training, even if you've got the knife there, um, sometimes that, that, that under that stress, the option to actually go to that, you know, the, the, um, the reaction to go to that uh, potentially life-saving tool um, sometimes isn't there. And I've got, you know, there's, there's, there's videos that I like to use sometimes to illustrate that point where people have weapons on their person and it takes them a long time or they never go to them um, during a, a life or death struggle. So. I think something small would be okay. But I think if you brought in that policy on knife, again, it's just another thing an officer has to deal with. Sure. I mean, we already know it's going to be a lethal situation. You know, well, you there's, know a, there's a there's another hit, kind of thought to John um, and, and to what Jared, what you had said and Ray, um, when I if I if I'm showing up and the suspect is unarmed and I have a knife on me, now there's a knife in the fight. And if I don't know how to use it and it ends up in the fight somehow falls out of my pocket or I go to go to draw it and I lose control of it, we're now creating more of an issue. And so if you're not training with it. Maybe it's best to leave it at home. I don't know. There's another tra train of thought. You would, you would think that with such a litigious world and community that, uh, you know, you got to be responsible for everything. You got to explain everything. If you did this, a bunch of people are going to ask you, why didn't you do this? That, uh, like, you know, if you're going to carry a knife, it absolutely needs to be trained. Um, and that's the only way to articulate why you went for it, when you went for it, what your intentions were, you know, the totality of the circumstances. You can't just throw shit on you. Oh, I didn't realize I had a flamethrower on me. Like, like you just like it, it's it's there. And, you know, you listen, when I work on a pistol, uh, I, I can I can use the pistol to open up a beer. I can use the pistol to hammer a nail. I can use the pistol muzzle strike. I can fire shots out of the, you know, the pistol. You, do you work with it? You know, and so it's ridiculous that uh, people aren't training with it. And uh, even if your agency, if you're a cop out there listening and your agency is like hands off, you can carry a knife, but don't tell us about it. It's incumbent on you. I don't know what your percentage is, Jared, but probably close to 30% of the officers that train with me self fund. Their agency doesn't support their training. They go, you know what? I'm putting myself in harm's way. I want to be skilled. And if you can't think to do it in training, what makes you think you're going to think to do it in the street? So like, you know, you, you go to reach for something and you're like, where's that knife? And you're like dusting the cobwebs off of it because you, you know, you can't even find it. There's something on it because you've never, you never uh, worked with it. Anyways. Um, um Tony just brought up an interesting point, and I didn't know if we were going to go down this rabbit hole or not, but we're here now. Um, it goes; it's kind of along the same lines of if you're if you're not keeping your body in shape, like what are you what are you doing? You have a responsibility to maintain a certain level of fitness if you're going to do a job as a peace officer, not just for yourself, but for the community or your partner next to you. Um, the question is this then we have a, you just said it a lot of officers have to pay out of pocket and the, for those that do they say if my agency isn't paying to train me i'm not doing training ridiculous at what point do we start having the conversation i know everybody here has had this and, or said this at some point that if you're not going to train turn in your badge but where where does that line get drawn because at, at some point tony you just said it the responsibility falls on us as an individual if I'm going to go to work today, I the responsibility falls on me to be qualified, capable, and competent to do my job. If I'm not that, where do we draw the line when it comes I, to... I, I, I did an article for Caliber Press a few years ago where I used a sports metaphor where, like, you're a pro football player, a baseball player, uh, and... <laughs> good one, Lon. Um, the... Uh, um, and I said, like, if you wanted to make the team next year, you didn't show up 100 pounds overweight, right? You were getting in shape in the off season because you want to start on the team. So it blows my mind when, you know, uh, you know, I, I, listen, I, I, I don't need any more haters, but, but cops are some of the laziest tactical athletes I've ever met. They don't want to train. 
one of the most common questions that I would get in the 40 years of me teaching is, hey, what time do we get out today? Like if I say, hey, do six reps of this, you know, if, if I stop because I'm talking to another group, like 90% of the class stops at six. Heaven, heaven forbid they do seven reps, you know, of, of something. Uh, Jared's smiling. He knows what I'm talking about. Um, but, but guys, gals, you're out there. Like this is literally like the meme, like the cliche. This is a job that could kill you. And, and there are people that want to do that for whatever, for God's sake or whoever you believe in. Get in shape for the fight. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how many opponents it's going to be. You don't know how long it's going to go. You, so you can't have theoretical ideas about, you know, heart rate monitors and duration and all that. You you got to be able to go. And the reason you're doing it, if you're if you're called to become a public safety professional, was was like I don't know why you would, you know, volunteer to be in law enforcement or public safety if you didn't have some sort of calling. But you got to take care of yourself. At the end of the day, you got to get home. You got to see your husband or your wife or your kids. You got your your future. Like I said, with that knife stabbing, if I whispered in that kid's ear five seconds early, if you take three more steps forward in five seconds, you're going to get stabbed in the throat. Thirty seconds later, you're unconscious. If he believed me, he'd have stopped. Because nobody wants to fucking die, other than you know suicide bombers. Anyways. Don't get me started. I need to go take a cold shower now from that. <laughs> well, that's certainly something that you could get me started on. And I think everybody on this panel already knows that case. But, you know, uh, Dr. Scheinberg in our film, he makes the point that agencies have a responsibility to ensure that their cops are prepared for that fight. And that means proficiency. That means physically. And that means mentally. And I think, Tony, that human nature dictates that to say that each individual officer, all nearly 900,000 of them in this country, have the uh, ability to take the individual responsibility for everything we're talking about here is just simply unrealistic. It has to come from each individual officer, and you want to believe that's why they're in the profession in the first place. But it also has to come from the agency, and I think the onus has to start with them through enforcement of actually being professional, okay? As in, it's not acceptable for your tactics to wane over a five, 10, 15 year period into your career. You have to recertify and you have to achieve a specific standard that is well-defined. Your physical fitness. Why is it that after the academy, virtually no department requires you to ever jump through the hoop of taking a physical fitness test ever again in your career? In mental health, same thing. Okay are never tested again and those are real issues that affect everything we're talking about today it's nuts <clears throat> well you know i used to work in, in in professional standards where we did hiring and i never had a marine to call me and ask us what uh, physical fitness re requirements that we had they just assumed that they could do it because they were marine what the ones we would get that would call us and ask us about our physical fitness test would be the ones that have already failed the other ones generally <laughs> And so if a department doesn't have a physical fitness requirement, they're going to get the leftovers that other departments are, they're, they're failing at other departments and they're going to get that. And so we also live in a litigious society where uh, we talked about that, where departments are worried about being sued. So they're worried about enforcing any type of standard within their agencies. And we talked about this uh, with the film as well, I do believe is, is we're at a point where it might be just best to start from ground zero and say everyone is grandfathered in from this point forward. And let's move well, also, and have some also have, fitness requirement. Like for us, you also have police unions, you know, which I, I like police unions for a lot of things, but for being a stump on the fitness categories and things like that, you have to go through a lot of hoops. So it's not just the administration. There's a lot of other bodies that are involved, like with our agency, for instance. Yeah, and I noticed more and more unions when we went up north and we were teaching in a lot of the northern states uh, compared to Texas where there's not as much unions. We have associations, but not necessarily yeah. unions. And uh, and I noticed more and more of that going on, which they had to jump through so many hoops with some of the unions that they had. Yeah, they're, they're right. great for, for officers' rights, but when it comes to fitness and stuff like this, there's not an appetite as there should be. Hey, Ray, was, it Texas, was it Texas DPS that did the uniform weight policy? Was it those guys? 
Yeah, they did. Uh, w- well, and we adopted that as well. My agency did before I left. Uh, we were required to do the row machine. And uh, so it was, you know, it was uh, 2000 meters uh, had to be within your weight and your your age and everything else had to had to fall into place. And then they were also sued. DPS was sued and they won a court case. You know, they were uh, they, they were also sued for the measurement of the waist and those kind of things. But, uh, you know, that they had a requirement there that you had to be, I think, it was under 40 inches uh, that you had to be under with your waist. Um, it was. I was my biggest pet peeve when I was with the Canadian forces um, was you could go to the QM and you could get a uniform size. That was literally a tent. Like you could fit three or four human beings in, in this one tunic and you're sitting there. You're like, why do we even make that? Why does that even exist as a thing? Right. If, if we're talking about in the military soldier first, what the, <laughs> why, how did it get this far? Um, but it's kind of the discussion in, in the public safety space as well. Um, there was a question on here. Um, where is it right here? Um, how much time do you spend on fitness versus a subject or control combatives training? Anybody care to field that one? Well, I think they kind of go hand in hand, don't you? I mean, uh, I think that if we're, if we're having a good training program, we're also getting physical fitness out of it. But if we're focusing on, you can't, you can't bring in people into defensive tactics and all of a sudden make them physically fit. You know, either they're going to be doing that or they're not. So do we want to separate the two? I think we do. I think we want to separate the two to a certain degree to where we're not, you know, having them out running around the building and things like that. Uh, we're actually teaching them a skill. Uh, so because if we take the people that are already overweight, we have them run around the building, they're going to hate defensive tactics. They're going to see that as as, as, as a downfall, even though they shouldn't. But they're going to see it that way oftentimes. Either people, it's just like touching a hot stove. You, you know, you're going to turn out, I'm not going to do that again. Well, it's the same thing with defensive tactics. If we make it into just a workout program, then uh, we're obviously going to have a lot of a kickback from that. And where injury rate potentially is going to go up as well. I have a, uh, go ahead, Jared, if you can jump I was, I was going to say, um, and, that, that, and, and a direct answer to that question, you know, I, I, I would personally say around a one-to-one ratio. Now, I, I'm a big believer in the importance of, you know, I was the I was the when I was working patrol and and, and through assignments, I was the kind of officer that spent my my lunch break in the gym in the, in the department gym, you know, and uh, uh, and then I would spend time and after you know after 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 work or sometimes during a, a, you know alternating days with another officer doing some defensive tactics training. There's so many reasons we can get into why. For me, my big one of my biggest uh, motivations was hey, when 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 stuff goes down, I want to be capable of handling protecting myself and other officers and the public. But there's so many other peripheral reasons why officers should be getting in shape. The health, the mental health, the physical health reasons, you know, sometimes officers, the biggest danger is not the bad guy, but just their, their you know, the potential health problems that they can have by, by being out of shape and overweight. But, you know, and there's no arguing with the fact that just look at professional fighters, that how much time they spend between their tactics, train, their technical training and just actually physical training. They put a huge emphasis on the physical training because there's no arguing. It makes them better fighters. So, you know, just the two of them go really go hand in hand. And that's why I say somewhat of a one to one ratio or maybe, you know, a little heavier on one side or the other. But I think they're both very important areas. But like at a, at, at a squad ahead. level, things change quite a bit because when you have calls holding and you can't train your scheduled time, you are not going to do PT with those guys. It's, you know, our department, I'm going to use it as an example, and I'm not trying to bastardize them, but they said proficiency. You know, meaning you have to write them off on proficiency of certain techniques. I think we can all argue that a couple hours is exposure at best, you know. So when you have calls holding, what's going to take priority in your station? Calls holding. we got some serious stuff going on. Well, hell, it's Vegas. we got serious stuff going on every night. <laughs> so it's like trying to get that time is an issue alone, even with DTs, let alone taking the guys for a run up to the, you know, up and back to like, you know, a nearby mountain or something you could do with them. you got to be creative, but at the same token, the pressures out there, uh, they just need to standardize things better and somehow make everybody capitulate because your chain of command, let's face it, they do have uh, an active role in how much training these guys are going to get from inside. That's why training outside of your department is so critical. Here's a question for everybody. Would you rather have an extremely fit, untrained person or an extremely trained, overweight, and out of shape person? Neither. <laughs> right? There's, 
but if I had to pick one, I want somebody trained um, because the the journey to acquire that competency means this 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 person can make decisions under duress. And obviously, the answer is, you know, I was doing something uh, years ago uh, uh, at the United Nations in New York for they had just it was right after 9-11 and they put together these 12 soldiers from different countries and we we're uh, creating this like response team in there and i i asked the guys i said how many of you can run up to the 37th and 38th floor where all the executives are and two of the people in the group of 12 said put their hands up and everyone else kind of looked around i said if the elevators are out bad guys are in the building this this is uh um uh you know uh, uh die hard you know un edition and you've got to get up there you don't 10 of you don't even know if you could make it up there and the two guys that that had done the runs and had been thinking out of the box were kind of gloating looking at each other and i said do you guys do that run with gear on and clothing or you were you wearing running shoes and shorts and they realized what i was saying like oh shit we, like we just did the run that was part of it well do the run with body armor on and do do the run with your with your kit and then i said do you do the run as fast as you can because the bad guys on the top floor aren't working out when you get there if you got to get there and at the, at the top of the run you're like <sighs> Hold on, I'll be with you in a second. Because you didn't understand how to pace yourself. I, look, we have an expression, and we have a, a, a program called combat calisthenics, and and it's it's this idea of something that somebody I forget who said alluded to in the beginning of this conversation. Can you blend good? Uh, I think it was uh, Ray alluded to that you're you're combining both, but can you blend your defensive tactics training and build? an aerobic and anaerobic component to it so that we're doing both at the same time. In other words, like I look at, at like rowing, if I were the guy and I'm always the contrarian, I go, why the fuck are we doing rowing? <laughs> like we're, this isn't this, we're not the coast guard and Oh my God, there's a fight. Right. And I got to row there. And I understand like, it's a safe way. We're not going to cause shin splints, less back injuries, but people can screw up rowing. But why can't you, have in the gym a short sprint to a primal gross motor, like underhook, overhook, take down, you know, get into like a, some sort of a grappling situation, go to a complex motor skill, put a hang and create a flow drill that involves what would actually happen in a fight. We've been doing that for years. We show it to people and they're like, wow, this is common sense. And I go, no, it's uncommon sense. If it was common sense, everyone would do it. But you can blend all this stuff uh, together. The point about the UN story was that that there's a, a couple of people in every agency that are like they're, they're the fitness buffs, but they can take it to the next level and go. Does this replicate the the tactical athletic challenge that I'm going to need in the, in this confrontation? And full circle back to your question, Adam. Um, unless it's a standoff or a protracted uh, uh, fight. Real violence is 10, 20, 30 seconds. And almost anybody can manage 10, 20, 30 seconds, right? So I want somebody to have skill. And I just saw a, uh, a, uh, a really funny meme with some successful uh, guy. And he's like 100 pounds overweight. And Larry King's interviewing him. And the guy's going, look, I like nice things. I wanted a nice watch. I wanted the nice car. I wanted to do this. I worked my ass off. I got all that stuff. And then Larry King says, why are you so overweight? And the guy goes, oh, because I like food too. Right? And it was just, at the end of the day, you got to you got to stop and come back to, um, uh, I don't remember who said it. I think it was maybe Jason, uh, but or maybe Jared. You, the elements of resiliency and mental health are directly connected to your physical fitness. Everyone understands the importance of physical fitness, but they don't realize, and there was a block in, in the documentary on mental health, but your the, the way you take care of your body also influences how you take care of your mind because mental fitness enhances, uh, sorry, 
physical fitness enhances mental fitness. And, and you can't be serious about your body without also becoming disciplined and resilient in your mind. Well, there's no doubt. I think what we're all talking about here is a culture change, right? I mean, that seems to be impeding us from moving forward where I think law enforcement absolutely needs to go. And, you know, to piggyback on what Tony was saying earlier in reference to the street athlete concept, that's something we talk about as kind of the crescendo of our film, uh, wrist lock, in that, you know, <clears throat> you take an athlete, you know, somebody everybody knows, like LeBron James, he spends famously a million dollars on his body every year. And yet the worst thing that will ever happen to that guy is he loses a basketball game. Now we talk about police officers who we all want to say we really care about. We want to go home at night, but what are the realities of your average police department in preparing that cop both physically, mentally, and in defensive tactics proficiency to be prepared for a situation where they're not going to lose a basketball game. They could lose their life or somebody else could get seriously injured or killed based on their actions. But we don't take it serious enough. It's a tremendous problem that I do not believe the public is aware of. You know, um, Lon Bartel isn't on the call. He may still be in the chat, but we've had this discussion many times. It's come up in the summit in the last two years. In fact, it's the first year we haven't talked about it, but you know, the, the professional sports industry has spent billions and billions of dollars optimizing human performance. In fact, I don't think there's too much about the human body and optimizing human performance that as a culture, we don't know and understand. It's frustrating that that information still cannot permeate into our sphere when it comes to law enforcement and public safety. There are still roadblocks to implementing those types of things, whether it's budgetary or otherwise. Um, but, you know, it. we have the information. Why can't we get it out to people? That's a really good question, Adam, and uh, that that's that's something that we seek to answer. I mean, if you a million dollar question, that yeah, that information is out there. As you said, professional athletes have been uh, seeking to increase their ability on the field for decades. That's nothing new. Uh, I think we have to, you know, change the philosophy in law enforcement and understand that that really is what it comes down to. It is about performance, and you have to change the culture. Cops uh, tend to find their way to too many habits that will always impede their performance. Too much alcohol, smoking, uh, they become you know, obese through poor nutrition, lack of exercise. And what baffles me is that your average police administrator looks at that and generally thinks it's okay. And I think there was a comment uh, earlier, I'm looking at it from, um, I think it was from Corey Leeper, uh, and Steve Flanagan, too, uh, who, who referenced the fact that if a young cop sees an administrator at the top who looks a certain way, well, they're going to believe that's the culture and it's OK. And they're right. Um, for anybody here who's watching this and they're part of the ILET Summit, um, Daryl uh, Harmon, who is a VP for ASP, um, did a case study that we released today as his session on himself. Um, how he had gained weight during his career and then the subsequent battle to, to get it back off again because he realized what it was doing. Um, and so that's uh, to exactly your point, Jason. Um, you know, it's it's we have to start sharing and talking more about it, right? It's a battle that every one of us has faced at some point, right? It's whether or not you wanted to let loose on the holidays or whatever. Um, but having open and honest conversations about our bodies, about our minds and about our performance, I think is is uh, the start of that uh, culture change that you keep talking about. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't you think, Adam, that, that every cop should have access to a dietitian to teach them how to grocery shop, to teach them how to eat properly, to teach them how to cook? Shouldn't they have access to a personal trainer that can give them a personalized plan for their height, their weight, their body, their abilities, and, and teach them, you know, how many reps do you do? How many sets do you do? These are the things that I think that your average cop has no clue about. I mean, they'll say they do, but they really don't. And as trainers, I feel like it's our responsibility to share that information. But I think it's going to have to come from the top down and, and ensure that agencies are giving their cops the resources to get that training. Because, it, I mean, it, it comes down to the longevity officer. We all want to retire, right? We all want to be healthy. 
And, you know, that harrowing statistic that, that comes up in our film from Dr. Scheinberg, where he says that the average cop lives to be 22 years less than the average civilian. I feel like that's just unacceptable. But at the same time, having been through a law enforcement career, we all know exactly why it shouldn't be too shocking. Um, to that point, and, and um, I want to play that clip because I think that's the one that we have with Ray that the uh, doctor's also in that one, right? Um, what, to that point, last year or the year before, we um, we did a little thing with ILFE with some training. And in fact, I brought a friend of mine, Dr. Chuck Samuels, who is the principal for the Center for Sleep and Fatigue Management out of Calgary. Um, he, was, uh, he ran the Canadian Olympic team. He wrote the Sleep and Fatigue Management Program for the RCMP. Um, I thought, I was like, you know what a great thing to do would be is why don't we take these firearms instructors that have a ton of downtime on the range um, and let's let's give them another arrow in their quiver. Let's teach them about sleep and fatigue management and let them share that information with their officers when you're sitting around, um, you know, doing all of the different tasks that we do when we're on a range, um, utilizing our instructors, utilizing that downtime to share knowledge and information that those officers otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Um, and so I love that from an instructor development perspective, giving off uh, instructors those tools to have those conversations that are kind of off the cuff where those students that we have in front of us, they're more apt to listen because they're not walking into a death by PowerPoint presentation. It's more of just me sharing some some uh, kind of wisdom with you during training. What do you guys think about that kind of stuff? Dramatic. So dramatic. Dramatic pause. Um, yeah. Well, fine then. Leave it there. I'm going to show, I'm going to show this video clip. To speak on that, Adam, I think if you brought in like the row machine, for instance, like we were talking a simple device that you could use, bring it into a firing range, have them do 500 meters on a row machine and then get off of it and fire their weapon. Now that simulates a foot pursuit prior to being able to engage with your weapon. And now we're going to see also the hit rate drop generally and during those because of phys physical fitness levels, too. And not only that, you've exerted yourself to a point to where uh, it's just gross motor skills that are that are kicking in. So, yeah, I think there's drills like that that you can, uh, you know, it's like firearms and defensive tactics should go hand in hand as well. Uh, because generally we're, we're first going to use our mouth and then we're going to use our physical skills. And then hopefully, I mean, if it does end up, uh, you know, in a deadly force situation, we're going to access a weapon or a tool that we have on our person to be able to use it. So all of them go hand in hand with each other. Uh, and when it goes back to administrations and like Tony was talking about, and you know, it's, it's difficult to in, uh, to implement a physical fitness program when your administrator may be 280 pounds themselves, you know, so that they, they have no interest in it either because they sit behind the desk and they've gotten unphysically fit. So now they don't want to tell their officers, hey, you need to get physically fit when they themselves are not physically fit. It's it's really bizarre. And it's it came back to something that, that Jason said uh, uh, way, way earlier. And that is, you know, with the with the. Uh, uh, sports team metaphor is when you think about the money that if you think about the money that is spent in excessive force negligence legal you know someone gets their nose busted medical <laughs> uh, the psychological you know uh, ptsd elements you would think the millions and millions and millions spent on that could be redirected preemptively where if you looked at all of because the cops represent the players on the field if every time the dallas cowboys went out and and uh they went out to restaurant to bar on the field they ran out on the field they punched a couple of fans in the face it was caught on camera uh, now the team's getting sued the the owners are getting sued they go out they wreck a restaurant if any time that happened there there are just like in sports there's hey if you embarrass the organization we can sue you you're off the team like there's there's stuff like that right if you reverse that and you get the the like somehow the administrations to go our players are the cops on the street or the first responders this is a, a code of conduct we want but to enhance that and to play the game at the highest level, you need to be fit. I'm going to make sure to come back to, like, like you know, we're going to do a blood test. This is what you're allergic to. This is how you should eat. 
This is your waistline. This is your, oh, we're giving you a knife. We're going to teach you to use a knife. It's ridiculous if we come back to, again, you know, part of the mission uh, when I was contacted about the documentary was because you, you, you can't, like, there probably should be two more documentaries going deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. But the first one is, is creating a groundswell education of, like, wait a minute. There's a lot more to this from the mental fitness, the physical fitness, the complex motor skills. Um, but uh, like, it's just insane to me that there aren't any standards, you know, for for this. There was no way in in any like the example you gave, like, you know, with with LeBron, you know, uh, he loses a basketball game. He rolls his ankle and then has like the best doctors in the world, you know, fixing his ankle and carrying him out no one's going to come kill him in a game. Right. Um, so it's just crazy. I just wanted to bring that back. Cause I think it's more important that at the highest level, if we all had a magic wand, we would say, you got to be fit. You got to be ready to go. It should almost be in the same way that like, if you want to get on a full-time SWAT team, not a lot of, uh, you know, a lot and a lot of cities have full-time SWAT teams. You want to get on a full-time SWAT team. You're getting in the best shape as you, you can for the tryouts because you don't want to fail because it's volunteer. But there, <coughs> there's a lot of places where like the over the uh, untrained out of shape cop gets a certain call. And what does he do? You know, he takes off his blue uniform and puts on his black uniform. And now he's on the SWAT team. And we got to somehow fix that. There's about 18 rabbit holes I want to go down, but I won't. Right. Um, I'm going to show this video with Ray and uh, let's let's jump into this next little clip here from uh, from Rislaw. To be successful in a hands on scenario, you've got to have both fitness, which can be strength. You've got to have endurance and then you got to have technique. If you don't, you resort to using disproportionate amount of force. We took an oath to take care of our community, and if I can't get there to stop that threat or stop that problem or get to my buddy that may need me, my partner who counsel me, and his family is counting on me to make sure he or she is okay, I've gotta be physically fit to be able to do that. Oftentimes, it's uh, check the box training that we see agencies have where they're really not dedicated to defensive tactics. They just wanna say that they do defensive tactics. And defensive tactics has to be built up from a foundation and continue into scenario-based training to where officers are building blueprints on how to respond out there uh, based on technique, based on concepts, based on physical fitness as well, uh, and you know, evaluating the situation to say, should I engage? All right, qualification versus training. There's a whole nother topic. You need about six hours to start unpacking that one. Ray, I'm going to let you jump in on that one because uh, that was you last in the clip. What are your thoughts? Do you want to contextualize that a little bit? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, there's the, the ones like with Texas Best Practices and other agencies that have uh, certifications that they receive that require them to do defensive tactics. The, you know, minimum of eight hours, for instance, some of them do. And uh, so, it, it, like I said, it, it goes back to, are they really evaluating what the officers are doing while they're in training and then outside of training? How many agencies are keeping track of how many times that an officer is successfully able to deploy techniques that they're taught during training, uh, communication, how, you know, decision-making skills. Like I said, it, it all starts even with the hiring process, even with the interview. Uh, we, we go in there and ask cop questions. We're going to ask people, what if you stopped your grandma? You know, what would you do then? Instead, we should be asking decision-making school questions because that's what we have to do on a regular basis. And then teach those good decision-making uh, people that are able to make good decision-making skills. Now, how to be police officers and make those skills out in the field as well. Uh, so uh, we really need to monitor what we're doing in defensive tactics and not just go in there and show techniques. And that's most of defensive tactics that's out there. And that's exposure. At best. Sure. I agree. Well, I do really like what Ray said in that particular clip where he talks about check the box training. One of the points that uh, uh, one of the, the other uh, contributors in the film, Mike Bland, makes in reference to training and that whole check the box theory is a lot of officers are under the misconception that that defensive tactics training is being done for them. 
But in the reality, it's not, is it? It's being done for the department so that they have a training record to cover them in a liability type situation to be able to say, well, we trained them. I don't know why he or she did this. And, you know, and that's why we kind of talk about uh, that in risk lock is to kind of cover that idea that, you know, the training level is just not where people in the public think it is. There's a, there's a comment here. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And I, I, one of my, one of my goals in life for everybody here, just so you know, um, is to get Bill Lewinsky and Bruce Siddle on the same call and talk about heart rate. But <clears throat> we'll, we'll see if that ever happens. I doubt it ever will. What are your guys' thoughts on, on this comment here about uh, inverted U heart rate practicing and, uh, and stuff like that? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in right away. Cause I've been saying that for decades. I know guys who have been in gunfights downrange uh, um, on V911. I was down at Fort Bragg training those guys, and I'm still friends with guys from then. And I know these guys, I've seen them shoot. We've done force on force drills. You don't think that if you just jumped out of an airplane, low crawled to a target, got into a gunfight, you're running down a hall, rounds are coming at you, and you're you're shooting people in the face. You think your heart rate's 120 beats per, per minute? Like if they had a polar heart rate on at that time, little you'd have like smoke coming out of the watch and little springs popping out, right? But they've practiced so much that their heart rate is whatever their heart rate is relative to the threat and the, the, the stimuli coming at them. I had a, an MMA fighter you know, back in, in Canada uh, before the UFC bought out everything, there was a, uh, I forget the uh, uh, association now, but it was like the UFC before the UFC bought it. And I had him on a treadmill doing sprints and we would do, we would do sprints, get his heart rate up to 178, 170, 180, crazy shit, and then have him jump off the, the, uh, the treadmill and go right into a pummeling grappling exercise into a position, into a grounded pound, and we'd cycle through that so that what we were saying to him is, yes, you will, because the, the hypothesis in the industry is you will lose control of your fine and complex motor skills if, you're, if your heart rate gets too high. Well, I added to that, you will lose control of them if you don't train your fine and complex motor skills with an elevated heart rate. The body-mind adaptation is amazing at what it can do. But it can't be it can't be a theoretical statement. You've got to actually do do the training. And we would do stuff. I, I put out a really short video um, introducing that combat calisthenics thing, where we'd be on a treadmill with with duty gear on, running. Heart rate comes up, and on the treadmill, draw and and engage imaginary targets while you're running, which is insane because if you lose the motor skill coordination between uh, what you're doing here with the complex motor skill and your legs that are running, you wipe out. It's like you start to go sideways on the treadmill. It's kind of embarrassing. But if you, the first few times you get it, you start to do like tank turret shit. You're running, you could draw and you reholster. You're running, you draw and you can do this carefully on a treadmill. And then suddenly you're, you're, you're scanning while you're running. And it's insane. But what it is, is you're blending a gross motor skill with a complex motor skill with a fine motor skill while you're thinking and your body can adapt to it. So the idea is there, if you pop up that, that, uh, that quote again, if it's still there, um, uh, Steve, um, ab absolutely it has to be trained. You can get really good at whatever you want to get good at with an elevated heart rate. You just got to go, you get some hard work. And that's especially because decision making is so crucial, right? I mean, if you can't make that decision under stress with an elevated heart rate, then really, what do you what do you have? It's kind of the equivalent on the range of firing at a, a paper target from a standing position that's not turning with no time limit. There's no stress involved. So it's the same thing here, making a use of force decision. I could tell you that in the late 1990s, one of the things we did. Our firearms range is basically located at the top of a mountain, which means that on East Craig Road that leads to it, there's a hill that goes straight up. It's a fairly steep hill if you were to run it. So what we did is we took uh, 
put put X's with spray paint on the asphalt about uh, 20 or 30 yards apart going up this hill and then put stations like you were talking about, Tony, uh, at each X and the recruit would have to sprint 20 or 30 yards and then demonstrate a defensive tactic. And they do that 10 times up the hill. And then because we're at the range, we'd have them run straight to the range and they would do failure drills on a target that uh, with, with, with a 10 second time limit. And so you want to talk about your heart rate being elevated and doing it under stress. It was an excellent drill. I don't know if they do that anymore, but it was effective and right along the lines of what you're talking about. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That, that kind of, yeah, it kind of brings to mind that, um, you know, some, uh, again, not, not to kind of get into war stories, but I think there's some things that some of our watchers, you know, our, our listeners here, people that are, are, are chiming in can, um, or can pick up on. And one of the things that when I was an academy instructor, and I, th I think with uh, training at elevated heart rate is essential. I think, you know, there has to be progressions. You've got to learn the physical skill sets with, with kind of a more of a calm uh, and uh, more of a learning environment. And then you got to put those those skills under that uh, under that stress. And, and, and um, you know, a lot of people use that term stress and stress inoculation type uh, situations where, you know, uh, the heart rate is elevated and you're, you're testing of uh, uh, use of false decision making, what, uh, what not. But one of the drills we would run when I was uh, an academy instructor was, and we would actually at that time because it was uh, it was right after uh, Tony had come out to our to Solid City PD. I was new in the training unit. This is two thousand four, and so we we bought some of the uh, the high gear suits and we would utilize them to good effect. And what what we would do is, um, it was a scenario day. It was towards the end of our our, our academy, and we would have after all of the recruits in in their vehicles, the personal vehicles with the radio. They had no idea what their scenario was and we separated them um, so they wouldn't be you know talking and we would just call them in one at a time and they would come in we'd have them do a bunch of pt to get their heart rate up and then we'd have them go into a room and it would be a a, a fight for your life scenario with one of our instructors um, and these were not just instructors these, just, these were our, our very um little our knuckle draggers uh as the expression goes, and um, and they would basically put them in a situation where you're, you know, we're going to ring their bell a little bit. They're going to see what they're, you know, see what how they're going to respond, and we're going to see what, if they use the tactics we've been teaching them throughout the academy. And then we'd put them, they'd come out of that, and we'd put them in another room, another scenario. And so we'd run them through three rooms um, back to back, where they'd be going through these little these these fight for your life type situations. And and um, you know, it was a, for us, we found it a great way to kind of uh, get that um, get that. Uh, that training where their heart rate is elevated, they're put into a stressful situation. Let's let's see what they do, kind of thing. And there's a lot of learning points that we found from that. Excellent, excellent. You know, to add to that, I think we also have to be careful <laughs> of of what we do and how we do it and how we implement training. And the reason I say that is because and I'm not going to mention the police department, but uh, it was a large agency here in Texas that I was dealing with and uh, training at, at their academy. And uh, while I was there, they would put two recruits into the ring with boxing gloves and headgear. On. And they would just swing for the fences and uh, knock, you know, they had two injuries while I was there and they would just mark their names off the board because they had other ones to fill their spot <laughs> to them. It was just numbers almost. And, uh, and I told them, I said, that's not how you train people. And they said, well, yeah, we've had, you know, we've had a brain injury and we've had uh, a death during this training. And they said, we're surprised we haven't been sued since, you know, before now. And so what I'm getting at is we can't take people in, in a police academy. They've probably never been in a fight in their lives stick them into a situation like that and expect good results. We first have to train them and train them slowly to build them up to where we want them to be. But that is also an encouragement process of, uh, you know, because we don't have, it's not like a fighter that walks in the, in the room, you know, and has a little thing I hear to the side that shows us all the mental things that's going through this person's head that's causing issues. Uh, so we have to first build confidence in them to be able to respond and then to give them the resources to be able to respond after that by building through training. You know, I, I totally agree with that, uh, partly because when I went through Utah State Academy in 2000, we had that exact thing. We put on boxing gloves, pair up the recruits and let them let them scrap it out. It was, uh, it was like maybe some morbid obsession by the instructors. But for me, it was a learning point because I had been training martial arts for several years by that point. And I was like, what are we trying to what are we trying to learn here, guys? And, and when I had the chance to become an instructor, I tried to, to, to orchestrate the training uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, to be able to, have, to, to focus on learning objectives and, and in, in a safe way, which is why I would always use instructors, um, to borrow one of Tony's terms, you know, that, that are trained on being a, a good bad guy um, and put them in that scenario so that they can, they know how to, they know what we're trying to bring out in these, in, in these recruits. They know how to play the role. They know how to keep it safe. And, uh, and that was, for me, that was extremely important. 
Well, Tony, Tony said it when we brought up the knife video at the beginning. If you, unfortunately, there are a lot of instructors who will go out and run scenarios and reality-based training programs um, without having any clue on how to actually do it correctly or responsibly. Um, and that's usually where we see people get hurt really badly. Um, and so um, do you guys have any suggestions on where we start with that, with the instructor development component? Yeah, I mean, I think Tony alluded. Go ahead, Tony. No, no, go, go ahead. I think Tony alluded to it. I mean, you have to practice before you push them into something that they have no idea about, such as you know, fist of fury to to get in a ring. They they have to have the they have to have basic concepts, basic concepts of what they're doing, whatever they're whatever they're doing. You have to obviously at some point you want to induce some stress. You want to induce something that makes them work hard, but you know, in reality. You know, it's all gross motor skills that you really want to impress upon them. They're not going to get super advanced techniques, but you have to focus them. You know, if they've never been in a fight before, that is a true statement. There are recruits, people in academies who have never been in a fight. Guess what? When when a punch hits them, what do they do? You know, they they're gonna they're gonna flinch quite a bit, more so than someone who has been in a fight. It's called experience, <laughs> right? I mean, it it just is what it is. Um, Tony, Tony, just, you could add to that, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I mean, a lot of it. So uh, like I, I, I interpreted Adam's question as, as more of like, uh, education. There, there are companies that really specialize in scenario design. Uh, you know, we're one of them. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a component of what we do, uh, in the, in the scenario design. Um, I don't know if any of you have had interaction with or training from Ken Murray, and, and or read his book, you know, training at the speed of life. Um, uh, I mean, he's got like 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 a blueprint for this, and goes around uh, and and does stuff like you 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 almost it's almost like like someone says, hey, let's let's play football, and you know, if you're in Europe, that's soccer, right? And if you're but if you're in America, it's football. If you don't understand how many players what the goal is, what direction you're running. So scenario-based training starts with like understanding the game. Um, and then, and then like, it's, it's, it's literally as the cliche goes, it's a crawl, walk, run. Uh, uh, hey, know. Tony, not yeah. to, not to cut you off brother, but I know Jared's got to jump here and I want to give him a second to just uh, say his last yeah. piece. And uh, before no, I hey, no, I, I, I really wish I could stay at, uh, this is a great panel, uh, a great discussion. I really value the input of, of the others that are involved here. Um, it's good to see each of you. Um, again, speaking of police training, I've got to catch a flight. I'm on, uh, I'll be teaching a, a course, helping my, my business partner teach a course with the North Carolina State Police starting tomorrow. So I gotta, I gotta run to the airport and get on a flight. But um, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Again, I really have the highest regard for each of you that are there and I appreciate everyone that's been able to tune in. Thanks, brother. Thanks, appreciate Sarah. you. Good to see you again, man. You too. Take care. Yep. Hope to see you guys soon. Bye. Tony, I'll let you finish yeah. up your thought there, brother. Um, nah, I mean, it was just, it was, it was, if somebody said, if somebody said to you, Adam, and I know you've got lots of experience, but if like someone said to you, Adam, and this is this is really how it goes, and I think I think like everyone else on on the call will nod. A lot of times here, the person that gets put in charge of defensive tactics training in a smaller to medium sized agency, someone goes, "Hey, I heard John's a black belt." So I heard you know uh, I heard you know so and so likes boxing, and they go, "Oh, okay," and they just make that person in charge of DT, and then you, what you end up happening is. The person's unconscious or conscious bias. I love boxing, so our standard's going to be striking, mm -hmm. even though hands are the most broken, um, the the most broken injured part of any fighter's anatomy. The, the, why you would teach anyone to strike with their hands in a street fight? You got boxers who break their hands with a yard of tape on and a glove on, right? So it's just this idea of not even thinking it through that if I want to look in terms of optics. If I'm trying to de-escalate, I want my hands open. I don't want to have any any. I mean, there's so many nuances there. But where I'm going is the people that are often put in charge of defensive tactics training and therefore scenario training aren't in the same way as the knife metaphor. They're not taught what is scenario training. What are objectives? What are our standards? What are we trying? What are we trying to do? How do we scale this? 
but there are companies out there uh, that 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 do stuff. But it starts from like like understanding what is the game, and 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 then building it slowly from the base up, almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The bottom tier is survival. That's all fear, psychology, primal gross motor. So many people focus at the top, the optics, what's this look like, self-actualization. And then the biggest mistake I think that's made in the defensive tactics training, aka scenario training, is the, the focus on fine and complex motor skills where in a high stress situation, it's got to be primal gross motor and gross motor. And that's where it starts. And when you get good and you get your reps, suddenly you're like, oh, I can control my heart rate. I can, my combat breathing's working here. I am communicating, you know, I'm not on the radio going, I need backup, right? Like you're not screaming. You're, you're, you know, like that, I don't know, that, that video that went viral, the, the, uh, the cop that got out of his car, took a sip of his coffee, pulled the rifle out and made that, that shot. Uh, yeah. You know, like, like everyone, everyone was so excited about that video. Like how cool, I mean, was it like a, does anyone know how many yards that shot was? You know, it was which, like two hundred yards. It was like insane, right? Where the guy's like driving, pulls up the coffee, and then gets out and makes the shot. And I always tell people this, and I've been—I was ranting about this this week. When we see something inspiring, we don't learn anything from it. We just want to do it. But when we see things that are done poorly, we know exactly what went wrong. And this is kind of a weird tangent, but. I've noticed over the years, like we have a block in our course called how to watch, how to, how to properly watch a dashboard or body cam video. Cause a lot of times they're watched in a way where you go, don't do this or do this. And they're not reverse engineered and dissected. A lot of times the way we do role playing or sorry, scenario training is there's always two role players. There's the good guy and the bad guy. You gotta be a good, good guy. You gotta be a good, bad guy. Because what we do is we do, we reverse engineer and replicate the scenario based on an actual event where somebody didn't do so well. So if I show you a video as an example, guys, of a, a boxer who jabs a guy, hits him with a right and drops him with a left, and it's a gorgeous movement. All of us are like, whoa, I want to go work out. We're inspired, but we didn't learn anything because you can't learn anything from a, a, a unicorn event. But what we, when we look at the defender, we go, he didn't move his head. His hands were too low. He wasn't controlling distance. That becomes a lesson. I'm just giving like kind of a nerdy example of, of how you need to go about, in my opinion, how we need to go about educating people to, to, what, to what John said. Most people have never even punched in the face. It, years ago, people came out of a military background, right, and then became cops. And then that slowly, slowly, slowly changes where a lot of people – who get in there like I've never even played contact sports, let alone something else. But I'm all over the place here. There's there's a system and a methodology. And if you have a responsibility for doing scenario-based training for your organization, you need to seek out people that have done it for years. And I'm not saying copy their shit or or adopt it exactly, but do the do your due diligence and get educated so you're not just making up shit. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in here, but we have about 15 sure. minutes or so left. So I just want to give um, give the opportunity uh, for anybody who has questions. If you have questions and you're in the chat, you're still here. Um, we have about 80 or so people between all the platforms that are here watching this with us today. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you guys being here and, and, and investing in yourselves and in your training. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat for the, the guests here, the speakers. We'll get to those. Uh, if we don't get to them today, I'll get them back to you um, as soon as I can afterwards. Um, but I also want to talk about wrist lock for a second before we, because we're going to lose track of time here and then we're not going to get a chance. Uh, Jason, I want to give you the chance to talk about wrist lock. Um, where can people find it? Where can they watch it? Um, what can they expect from it? So do you want to just maybe take two seconds and explain um, where they can get a hold of this uh, this awesome, awesome video? Yeah, sure. Uh, we released our documentary film, Wrist Lock. It's called Wrist Lock, the Martial Arts Influence on Police Use of Force, as you can see on screen, uh, back in September uh, 20th. Uh, it's currently available on all the transactional platforms, so you can find it on Amazon, Apple TV, uh, Google Play, and the Microsoft Store. 
And uh, yeah, we would really uh, appreciate, you know, everybody watching to support this film. Uh, we believe that the message is, is something that needs to become a part of the conversation, particularly the conversation of the mainstream. You know, a lot of cops will watch this film. I always get it all the time. People will say, well, you know, every, every cop in every academy needs to see this. And though I certainly wouldn't disagree, I also don't believe that any chief or sheriff or administrator would show their recruits uh, or new officers this film. And the reason why is because every new officer who uh, has any level of intelligence is going to watch this movie and then is going to point to their own administrator and say, are we doing this? And of course, the, the answer is going to be no, we're not doing any of it. And, and that's a fair question that they're not going to want to answer. In my opinion, it needs to go out to the mainstream. It needs to be talked about by people who know nothing about police but think they do and are basing their opinions and perceptions based off the couple of seconds of video they see every now and then. Based on what flavor of news they're watching, it's going to be spun in a manner that is going to be you know, more than likely uh, attached to a certain political party's ideology. In, in police, I, I feel like we need to be politically neutral. And, and especially as it relates to serving the community and these use of force issues, which are always going to be inevitable as long as we do not have proper proficiency <laughs> in defensive tactics, physical fitness, and mental health. And, you know, we were lucky enough to assemble a cast of, of, of 17 very high-level martial artists and police experts. Uh, you have seen four of them here today, and I would certainly encourage uh, anybody who sees this film to seek out uh, Jared, to seek out Tony Blower and John Gentile and Ray Bashirs because they are doing this for a living now. They are out there training our cops at the level that they need to be so they're prepared for their next fight. That's awesome, brother. I appreciate that. And Tony, I'm going to give you a second to say your goodbyes. I know you got to jump as well. Um, and if you guys aren't already aware, Tony did a presentation for this year's summit, which is going to be going out on Thursday. So if you want more of him, you're going to have to stay tuned and, and jump back into the summit on Thursday. Tony, uh, last thoughts before you jump off. Yeah, I mean, I I, I was obviously uh, flattered and honored to be uh, uh, part of this uh, crazy, uh, the, the like the the cast uh, of of this is amazing. Uh, like Jason said, um, check it out, whether you're a martial artist, DT instructor, but, but get it out there. It's, it's, I, I mean, I would love things, the conversation to go, why aren't we treating cops like the players on the team? Why aren't they getting the budget and the education to do that? Because you can bitch about, oh, police brutality and they're not trained and they're not that, but that, you, you know, I, it, it's a two-edged sword because I'm like the type of guy that, that, I mean, I, I try to do something every day to stay in shape as an aging athlete. And everyone listening to this is an aging athlete, regardless of what you do. Uh, but there's an element, if I tell my kids as a parent, you should eat properly and work out, but I don't put good food in the house or create the opportunity. If you look around my gym, my wife, my daughter, my son are always surrounded by the opportunity to train. We need to take better care of our, our police officers. And part of it is that conversation. So, um, Jason, thank you for your, your commitment and uh, uh, in, 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 in bringing that. And I hope there's a, a second and third iteration of this as it gets, as it gets more dialed in as to what uh, what cops need to do. But guys, I got I got a role. Adam, as always, you're doing an amazing thing with Islet and, and what you're doing, bringing the training around the world, bringing people together uh, to have the conversation. A lot of people, particularly in the martial art world, we look at, oh, he does Kung Fu, or like the line from Bruce Lee in Return of the Dragon, who can do karate better than Japanese? Like, and I always, I always make the joke when I'm saying stuff, don't hate me, hate the bad guy. Like, it doesn't matter who you're training with if you're training uh, because you're, you're, you're at a baseline, you're doing something more than you were doing yesterday. Uh, but it's if there was no violence, if there were no bad guys out there, we wouldn't need cops and we wouldn't need to be in shape and we wouldn't need to manage violence. So, you know, all of us need to come together, create a more uh, cohesive and coherent conversation about enhancing survivability and, and improving uh, the mental fitness around around this, because what's happened in the last few years uh, has had 
way more profound. We don't even know the impact on, on the emotional, psychological side and won't for several years. So guys, be safe. As always, great to see you. And uh, we'll be back soon. Thanks, Tony. Later, Later, guys. Tony. Oh, good. We're back to full. I hate odd numbers on this thing. It drives me up the wall. I don't know if it's the OCD in me. But, um, 10 minutes left. I want to open up the floor to you guys. Um, there was a question in the chat about uh, thoughts on anything uh, to use other than a carotid control hold since it's no longer allowed. They're allowed to use it in California. That we do not. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> that is, it was a lot longer than a 10 minute conversation. Um, if you do want, um, I've done no less than a half dozen podcasts, almost specifically around uh, carotid controlled rear vascular neck restraints, um, lateral neck restraints, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's documentation on there. Uh, Chris Butler and Dr. Oh, and I'm going to, I hate that I can't remember this right now, did a phenomenal study on this. Um, it's kind of the Bible when it comes to the actual science behind that. Uh, if you're interested, um, reach out to me specifically. I'll send you all the information um, directly via email. Um, okay. Last thoughts, gentlemen, on, uh, on either the wrist lock, on defensive tactics in general, on conversations we've had today, or on any new topic that you'd like to bring up that we can hammer through in the next eight minutes. I'll just say, uh, listen, I just got to say this for a group of guys who I know literally don't shut up when I'm talking to you all one-on-one, I put you in a group and it's just like, I don't even know what's happening right now. This is a complete shock to me. I think we just don't want to step over each other. (laughs) That's that's, that's probably respect, but I think, uh, listen, just close it up on wrist lock. I don't know how long we want to talk about that, but we want people to watch it. And, uh, you know, we picked a great cast. And I was fortunate, Jason had that vision, and I was fortunate enough to be the stuntman and the person who went out and got to meet everybody. So really high-quality people, a lot of good angles in that movie, um, and a lot of good ties in with not just the physical but the mental part of what it takes. And I think it's a good education piece, and it's at least a, a piece where people can have conversation after watching it or even question what's going on around them, you know, and have, because let's face it, the public really is a component that they just don't have enough understanding of knowing what's going on. They'd probably be a lot less harsh with the police if they knew a lot more, you know, education wise. Oh, absolutely. You know, to touch on that, I'd agree with that 100% that uh, we do a poor job in law enforcement of educating our community what we do and why we do it. And so we have to lot, have to be much better at the local level of educating them and what officers are dealing with on the street and why officers are responding the way that they do. In our state, matter of fact, they require now that officers go up and teach uh, individuals going to get their driver's license, young people, um, how to interact with law enforcement on traffic stops or pedestrian stops before they come into contact. That way they don't put their hands into the glove box or under the seat or things like that to can, you know, make the officer think that, the, you know, they're reaching for a weapon. Uh, so, like I said, we just have to do a better job of not only educating our officers, but educating our community as well. And I think this film does that, too, and helps to helps to uh, mitigate some of the some of the issues that we're having. Um, yeah, I think because of film and TV, what's happened over, you know, these last number of decades is, is the general public has a different perception of what police officers do and how they are trained, which is what we're talking about here today. I know it's mentioned in the film that, uh, you know, a lot of people in the public, uh, thanks to film and TV and thanks to social media and thanks to the mainstream media, believe that all cops are superheroes and that they can kick everybody's ass and that they have all of this uh, you know, for secret training that really doesn't even exist. And, you know, until we kind of get past that, be honest as a law enforcement profession and make meaningful change, then we're going to continually have the same result. There will never be any question in my mind as to why, you know, I turn on the news and I see the latest, you know, body cam video or cell phone video of a cop who is handling a situation uh, that you can clearly attribute to some level of poor performance, whether that be tactically, physically, or mentally. And, and that's really what the film is about, is pushing that message and hopefully starting a conversation. 
and just a small tidbit is the martial arts influence, obviously, you know, it comes down to like, really the, the basic theme is if you practice and you're regular training regularly, you're going to make better decisions. And so martial arts inherently someone who trains, it doesn't matter what system or whatever you train in. It's, you should train in everything if you can, but it's going to give you more confidence. It's going to give you those things to make you better. And so that coupled with the, the profession itself, or if you're not in the profession, martial arts can help you in a lot of ways. And I think, I think that was another component that we tried to bring into it. Uh, it's not too emphasized in this conversation, but the roots of it for people who have kids or you want better leadership skills, martial arts is pretty good. can help you in a lot of different areas. I got to tell you, I have a, I have a, well, I have four kids, two, three, four, and five. And the, the four-year-old and five-year-old, um, I'm getting them to start roll. They're starting to roll now. Um, we do like 10, 15 minutes a day, just, just getting used to body awareness, right? Nothing more than that, but there is nothing more entertaining than watching two little kids try to roll around and gain top like position. It's the funniest thing in the world. Um, Great place to start. But uh, John, to your point, and, and um, you know, we, you're right. We didn't talk a lot about martial arts here. Um, obviously that is a, a core passion of every single one of us who is on this call today. Um, officers always ask, people always ask in general, what, what should I take? What martial arts should I do? Where should I start? But you had said it, just start, just do, just train. Yeah. You know, Training. as you, as you, as you progress in your life and in this journey within martial arts, you're going to find your way. Um, if you ever have questions, this panel here, anybody who's associated with us, um, please feel free to ask us any questions you ever have. And if I don't have the answer for you, I'll pass you over to John. Cause he's been around long enough. He probably has all of the answers for you. Um, so <laughs> on that note, um, gentlemen, um, I'm going to ask you just to stick around for a quick AAR um, uh, before you jump off, um, once we cancel the live feed here, um, and I'm just going to do a quick, uh, last few things. Is there any last minute thoughts you guys would like to share with the, with the crowd today? Yeah. You know, I was going to also touch on, you know, since we mentioned that, I, you know, and I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well, but, uh, we cannot just teach our officers Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and just think that we're, we're solving the problem. We cannot just send them to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gyms, sports gyms, and, and not have the foundation of training with inside the agency itself. The foundation of how to use force needs to be within the agency, within the agency, and then they need to train on the outside of the agency with a martial arts gym or something like that to reinforce that training and help them. But at the same time, the foundation of it needs to come from within inside the agency, and that means those administrators doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. All right, guys. Well, if you guys want to stick around here for a second, um, I will address the uh, the masses. Uh, everybody, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us for this session of uh, the Instructors Roundtable here on the 2022 ILET Summit. If you're not already registered and you're not part of the ILET Summit, um, we're going to put some links below in this video. You can go to iletsummit.com, I-L-E-T summit.com. Click the link. It's right at the top of the page. It's going to take you, let you log in, get access to all of the amazing trainers and training that is available to you for free, 100% for free this week. So make sure to take advantage of that and share it with all of your friends and all of your colleagues. I do want to say a big thank you to our friends over at Axon for supporting today's version of the summit. Uh, they're an amazing sponsor, amazing supporter. And if you haven't already, check out TaserCon. That's going to be taking place in Las Vegas, January 23rd to 26th. And of course, thank you to our friends at ASP. They've done an amazing job. They do a lot of training. For folks that don't know, they have over 3,000 instructors internationally that conduct training for free for law enforcement. They're an amazing organization and definitely deserve our support. So with all of that being said, thank you guys for being a part of this roundtable with us today. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. Thank you for helping us change the standard of law enforcement changing uh, training around the world. And uh, I'm honored every time I get the chance to speak with you guys tomorrow. If you are available between noon and two central time, same bat time, same bat channel, we have another live round table right here. And we're going to be talking about mental health and wellness. And you've met Jason already. Jason, a few years ago, created a documentary called Wounded Blue, um, starring a gentleman by the name of Randy Sutton, who will be involved in our round table tomorrow. We are doing a full viewing of that one hour documentary live here at the ILET Summit 
or if you're watching it on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, it's going to be available to you. And then we're going to be following that up with an amazing discussion um, with some amazing experts and former law enforcement officers uh, who have gone through some stuff and are going to be sharing their experiences with you. So hopefully you can join us for that. That's it for us here at the uh, 2022 ILET Summit and this IRT. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you tomorrow.